Live dating. Star Wars kid. David's been to the dentist. Charlie bit my finger. Click. Classic only for the chandelier posiers in your Leicester. area. This week, Click looks at the TV of the future, which promises to make the living room a more interesting place than ever before. But can you cope with everything that's going to be on it? We'll also catch up with the father of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales, to hear his continued plans for its world domination. Plus, a view from the Kinect games controller that its makers didn't want you to see. And office presentations but interesting a great way to jazz up the daily grind in webscape welcome to click i'm spencer kelly in the space of a few short years the tv has undergone its biggest transformation in decades today huge high definition flat screens grace many a living room hanging on the wall where the family portrait used to be but now TV is on the cusp of another defining moment in its history. The stuff we're pumping into it is being radically transformed as the box itself becomes smarter and more connected than ever before. Richard Taylor takes up the story. The vision and sound are on. The station goes on the air. It was once all so uncomplicated, just one, two, or maybe a few TV channels to choose from. Then as cable and satellite made their presence felt, so did dozens upon dozens of further channels, the inevitable 24-hour programming, and lots of repeats, of repeats, of repeats. Yes, the multi-channel universe had been thrust upon us, and the living room had never felt so alive. And yet, at the same time, just about 10 feet away, in a study or a bedroom, another multimedia metamorphosis was sending the personal computer through its own convulsions. Thanks to faster internet speeds, comedic canines, along with other user-generated fodder, were fast becoming a staple of the online experience. And for the less fluffy stuff, dodgy file-sharing sites were also springing up for those in the know and with the will to rip off TV shows and films. Faced with this file-sharing free-for-all, the movie studios and TV networks, both here in LA and elsewhere, knew they had to act fast if they were going to save their hides getting a serious digital whipping. And so they did, giving us the option of watching films and TV shows online, even though the chances were we'd probably be watching them through a computer monitor. Inevitably, though, it was only a matter of time before these two worlds collided. TV content was already being fast-tracked inexorably to the Internet. Well, the logic of convergence would surely see the Internet arrive on our TV sets as well. But there was a problem. Actually getting the content off your computer and onto your telly in the living room wasn't all that easy. OK, you could use a variety of leads, but not many people really knew how to do it or frankly had the inclination. So the thinking went, why not use something which is already online and connected up to the back of your box? Over the past few years, games consoles have been the primary way in. Both Sony's PS3 and Microsoft's Xbox double up as fully-fledged entertainment hubs, and recently more content has been drip-feeding onto both platforms. Now though, the competition to bring the net to your TV is hotter than ever. Relaunched last month, Apple TV is a small box which connects up to the back of your big box. Unlike its previous incarnation, it doesn't need a computer at all and has no onboard storage to speak of. This time around, its main purpose in life is to stream video, be it paid content from Apple's own store and partners, or free stuff from YouTube or podcasts, some of which look incredibly impressive in glorious HD. As you'd expect from Apple, the interface is clean and intuitive. As you might not expect from Apple, it's also pretty cheap and under 100 bucks. The idea is for Apple to make the serious cash when you splash out on the actual content. So, a game changer for the living room? 
I don't know if it's going to be a game changer. It is certainly a much more interesting product. The fact that they've brought in several different providers, not just Apple content. It used to be you could only buy iTunes content on an Apple TV. Now I can get Netflix. I can also get YouTube content. I hope that portfolio expands so that there are several providers. And then it'll be the question of can the consumer search across multiple providers to find the piece of content. I just want to find this movie or this TV show. I don't know who has it or at what price. I just want to find it. So how will Apple address the next consumer demand? They've allowed multiple providers. The next step is searching across multiple providers or discovering across multiple providers. But Apple are only part of this story. Google have ambitions of their own in this arena. Their idea to bring us Google TV, a whole world of internet and TV, all married by their core strength search. Start with the same TV you know and love. Now add the ability to search for and tune to channels and search for and tune to individual shows. Google TV also has a built-in web browser, which means that the entertainment options you can search for, record, and save now include the entire incredible breadth of content that's available today across the web. I'm not sure consumers really want the entire web on their TV. Uh, TV is a lean back experience. Um, Google talks about search a lot because that is their wheelhouse. That is what they know well. If you're searching, uh, we know from Roby's experience and from polling our customers, we know that about 83% of people when they sit down to watch TV, they have no idea what they want to watch. Um, so to say I'm going to search for something, I don't even know what's on. That's where most people start. So it's going to have to be recommendation. It's going to be, have to be social networks. Tell me what my friends are watching. Tell me what's hip right now. Tell me what is a big show that's doing well that's new this season. Um, those are the kind of things people want to know about. Now, Google TV is a service, and Google are partnering with set-top box makers to build devices which sit atop TV sets. But there are also plans to actually hardwire Google TV into your goggle box itself. It means the TV makers have got a gilt-edged opportunity to differentiate their flat screens from those of their competitors and make money by partnering up with content providers. Yahoo, another name intimately associated with the web, was the first to embrace this trend, partnering with a few big-name TV manufacturers last year. Its philosophy is that TV viewers don't want a full-on web browser, but rather the best of the web optimised for a TV experience. So you can personalise the television to your own profile and then interact to your heart's content, be it streaming video from Amazon or checking out Facebook feeds and Twitter chat. We looked at the way people are uh, consuming content in the living room with their laptops and their cell phones and a lot of it's very small, short check-ins for information and updates. And they really want to be able to still watch TV, so TV has to be prioritised. So when we're able to do that, we designed our UI to where you can actually get into the content check what you're interested in finding out about, and then if you really want to actually replace TV, then you can go into full screen video or a full screen game. But otherwise, you can actually check all your content you're interested in while still watching television. In addition, you can actually view content associated with your TV program, such as watching conversation on Twitter while you're watching the latest news program. That then, the story so far, at least as told by the major players here on the west coast of the United States. And it's a TV drama very much still in its opening season. But next week I'll be checking out the South Korean version of this story. There you can order a holiday by clicking on the background of a TV movie as you're watching it, set your own price as you upload your own content efforts for others to watch, or even gen up for the national curriculum. Now that's got to be worth watching. Sounds good, looking forward to it. That's Richard Taylor. Now a look at this week's tech news. Facebook users will have a new message system in the next few months. The social networking behemoth has announced plans to bring together email, instant messaging, Facebook chat and SMS into one conversation stream for each of its 500 million users. This comes not long after revamps from the major email providers, including a new look AOL mail and a recently redesigned Yahoo mail. The British culture minister Ed Vasey has backed the idea of a two-speed internet, allowing ISPs to charge companies which produce content needing lots of bandwidth. It's a move designed to help pay for internet expansion, although it's been criticised as a death knell for net neutrality, the idea that all data should be treated equally. 
And after years of legal wranglings, the Fab Four have finally gone fully digital. The Beatles' back catalogue is now available to download from iTunes, bringing together history's biggest selling band and the world's biggest music store, and plugging one of the highest profile holes in its catalogue. But for anyone who doesn't already own their songs, bear in mind that the CDs are actually cheaper to buy at some online stores than the downloads. Last week, we reviewed the big new accessory for the Xbox 360 video games console, the Kinect. This magic black box watches you as you prance about in front of it and translates your movements into games controls, allowing you to do such magical things as steer rafts, beat people roughly around the head, or pet cute, cuddly animals. Essentially, it's two cameras and one infrared projector which can sense your position in 3D space. And that means, in theory, it's useful for more than just controlling games. And that's a thought that's been shared by several enthusiasts around the world who have decided to plug their connects into PCs, not Xboxes, and hack them. In fact, it didn't take long for the first hack to appear, three hours to be precise, as this inventive Linux programmer picked up a $3,000 bounty offered by the Adafruit website after he got his connect talking to a normal PC rather than an Xbox. Uh, it's RGB and that's depth. You know, it's actually surprisingly easy to interface with this device, so, you know, I think it will be pretty damn good for a lot of uh, projects, especially robotics. From then on, things got really interesting really quickly. This is the most instructive demonstration I've seen of how Kinect sees the world, as given by University of California researcher Oliver Kralos. Since the camera only looks from one point of view, uh, there's a big shadow behind me right here. And if you look at me from the other side, there's no back to my head. It's really fascinating stuff. And I'm sure that there are plenty of people who are coming up with new and innovative ways to use all that picture and depth information. For example, Florian Echtler has created a Minority Report style picture viewer where you can scroll past and manipulate images just by waving your hands in the air. You can see the man himself in the top left corner as seen through the three weird eyes of his Kinect. And remember I said that the Kinect has an infrared projector too? Well, there are plenty of users who are interested to find out just what kind of infrared beam the Kinect is kicking out. And the best way to find out is, as I'm sure we all know, to switch on night vision. This video is one of many to do just that and take a look at just how much it peppers the room with thousands of infrared beams. Isn't that incredible? Brilliant! And if you see anything as mind-boggling as that, then please do get in touch and we will share it with the rest of the world. Email click at bbc.co.uk or tweet us at bbcclick. Now then, if you type a question into a search engine, the chances are one of the top results you'll get back will be from Wikipedia, the online encyclopedia created and maintained by, well, everyone. It's the realisation of the dream that one day the internet would hold all of the world's knowledge. Although its founder, Jimmy Wells, has admitted in the past that having millions of unvetted contributors can lead to a few fibs creeping in amongst the facts. That said, he is confident that his baby will continue to grow. After all, there are already 250 million people using Wikipedia every month. Jimmy Wales founded Wikipedia and Wikimedia in 2001. The Wikimedia Foundation is a non-profit organisation which coordinates a host of projects dedicated to bringing free content to the web. Jimmy does have a for-profit business in the shape of Wikia, which is an ad-funded information source. Wikipedia itself, though, arrived at a time of technological turmoil. Wikipedia was born out of the dot-com crash, and there were points in time when we would have some problem on the website where the natural instinct, had we had $10 million in funding, would have been, oh, we need to hire some moderators. We're going to have to have a team of moderators. And so you could easily imagine going down a path where, after a few years, you end up with a system that requires 
500 paid moderators monitoring everything. And instead, we didn't have that. And so we said, oh, well, we have these problems. We have to figure out how do we develop social systems and uh, community-based systems to resolve these issues. What are the rules that you need? Okay, well, we need administrators. Well, how do you make sure they're not tyrants? Oh, well, there have to be some rules, and those rules have to be enforceable in some way, and there has to be openness and dialogue about those things. Wikipedia may be governed by rules which are enforced by its online community, but the sheer breadth, scale and subject matter covered in some of its articles isn't popular in all quarters, particularly where governments have strict censorship regulations. When we see the way Wikipedia is being used all around the world, it, it ends up being very similar everywhere. Uh, we do have concerns about censorship. Um, we faced a lot of problems in China, for example, although things are better at the moment, but we'll see what the future holds. Uh, and many countries around the world uh, very inappropriately filter uh, political information they don't agree with or, or like. And they you know, block websites, uh, not for anything other than opposing the existing government. This is really, really a bad problem. And we've taken a very strong stand that we will never compromise on censorship. We'll never participate in censorship. The information available on Wikipedia's pages is, of course, free, but in the developing world, the technology to retrieve this information, principally computers, can be an expensive luxury. One of the things we really focus on when we're thinking about the growth of Wikipedia in the developing world is this issue that many of the people who come online for the first time are going to be on a very small handheld device where contributing to Wikipedia is going to be very, very difficult. And there's nothing about software. I mean, you know, typing on an iPhone is never going to be comfortable. It's just too small. Um, so there's several avenues uh, that, I, that I take when I think about this. So first of all, we see now with a device like the iPad, uh, which I don't think is going to be in itself a major force in the developing world. Apple is always on the high end of the market. But they also innovate and they show the way for the future. And so we can imagine very cheap devices following that, that form factor. Many of the people who I've talked to in the past, say five years ago in India, I might talk to someone and say, well, gee, I, I see you're contributing in English. Uh, why aren't you contributing in Bengali? And they'll say, well, you know, that would be nice, but basically everybody who has a computer can read English. Uh, don't, you know, people don't really read Bengali on their computer. Mm, I don't really see the point. Um, now, as that next generation of people come online, the people who are elite, meaning they are well-educated, they have access to a full computer, broadband internet, they suddenly have a much greater incentive to want to participate because they have an audience. Often confused with Wikipedia, whistleblowing website WikiLeaks is an entirely unrelated organization, but it has embraced the philosophy of its users freely sharing news and information. Some of it controversial, including the recent online publication of 400,000 classified US military documents relating to events in Iraq after the 2003 invasion. Like many people, uh, I'm, I have mixed feelings about what they're doing. Um, I've been uh, cautioning that they should be careful uh, with what they're doing because some of the information that they could be releasing could be dangerous uh, to good people. Um, at the same time, I'm a huge fan of the concept that if there is wrongdoing, that we have avenues in society for whistleblowing. Well, I think there's a right way and a wrong way to go about that. And so I'm just advising WikiLeaks to slow down, be a little careful, um, there's no reason to dump everything on the internet all the time. There's, there's interesting possibilities here. So the online community continues to feed the Wikipedia information engine, but what next for the electronic encyclopedia? When I think really further out, you know, 10, 15 years, I haven't got the least clue. I always say I'm a, I'm a carpenter, not an architect. So I'm, my job is to hammer the nails and uh, sort of keep building things. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to project, really. Jimmy Wales, founder of Wikipedia. Now then, if you work in an office where people are liable to give the odd presentation or two, you'll probably, at some time or another, have suffered death by PowerPoint. It is an invaluable presentation tool, but boy, can it be dull if it's done wrong. Well, we have a solution for you, and that's to get Kate Russell to do them for you. Do your own dirty work, Spencer. Or better yet, get Visual B to do it for you. Harold's got a swarm of bees. 
Visual B is a plugin for Microsoft PowerPoint that turns designing a snazzy presentation into an absolute breeze. Once installed, all you have to do is add the text to your slides and this software will automatically add pictures, format layout and jazz up the theme with some funky transitions, all with a click of one button. With the option to set a mood for your presentation, be it formal, colourful, extreme or artistic, you can be sure of creating something that's right for the occasion. And if you don't have any images of your own to use, don't worry, the plugin can dig into its own extensive image bank and find something suitable. The plugin is free to download and try, but you will have to pay a small fee to save your presentations. Or there's a subscription option if you find it super useful. Altogether, a great productivity aid that will save oodles of time. So you can spend more of your day at the water cooler catching up on the gossip. We're constantly being told to get on our bikes. I mean in the healthy living context, of course. But with fast-moving traffic and punishing hills, choosing the greener and healthier route can be more than a little daunting. Enter Bike Hub, a free app for your iPhone that should be every UK cyclist's new best biking buddy. This is a cycle route planner that draws on intelligence from cyclestreets.net a website that uses something called mathematical graph theory algorithms in order to define the best cycle routes in the UK, taking into consideration things like traffic, accessibility and the lay of the land. I want to ride you can choose between different modes. The app automatically routes away from hills wherever possible, but if you do want to go for the burn, choose the shortest route. No pain, no gain. I want to ride it where I Twitter has become so big, it's almost the first place I look when I want to find out what's happening. One boom is in the number of companies now routinely advertising job vacancies in 140 characters. TwitJobSearch.com is a service that keeps its eye on around 50 million tweets a day, looking for prime employment real estate to serve up to its job-hungry followers. There's even an iPhone app if you want to job hunt on the run. Grey skies and work things. When you search for a keyword, this system analyzes it semantically, looking for other areas of interest that you may have, making it much more powerful than a regular search engine. New jobs are listed in real time as they're posted, giving you a definite advantage over anyone searching through traditional channels. You can sign into the site with your Twitter ID and link it to your LinkedIn profile and any other online CV services you use, providing prospective employers with as much detail as possible about your relevant experience. Then just sit back and wait for the job offers to come rolling in. OK, so you'll probably need to be a bit more proactive than that. But in this competitive world of rapid-fire communications, this site just might help you get your foot in the door before the next candidate. Recommendation engines are all the rage these days, so it's hardly surprising that Google want a finger in this growing tech pie. Well, for them, it's more of a hot pot than a pie, as they launch this week their own recommendation engine. It goes deeper than Google Maps' existing location reviews by tailoring its recommendations based on what you and your friends like, or even don't like. As well as the browser interface linked to the Places feature, it's integrated with Google Maps for mobile. On Android, this gives you a widget that you can pin to your home screen so you can express your opinion as soon as the urge overtakes you. Other smartphone handsets will have to go through the browser. And that was Kate Russell. All of Kate's links are available at our website, bbc.co.uk slash click is the link you need. You'll also find a video stream of this programme up there and a link to technology on the radio. Yes, it does exist. Our sister programme is called Digital Planet and it's on BBC World Service Radio. This week, the team meet the pioneers of 3D printing. 
Get in touch whenever you feel like it. Tweet at BBC Click or email us click at bbc.co.uk. We love hearing from you. That's it for now though. Thanks for watching and we will see you next time.